Thank you, Professor Copeland. And it's an honor to be here at the Champala Mode Center for the Unknown and to be among my esteemed and respected colleagues. And here are my uh, financial disclosures from grants I've received. Uh, here's a patient I saw about two years ago who has a uveal melanoma. It was overlying the optic nerve. Uh, he, we decided to enucleate his eye, and his eye was enucleated, and uh, we sent some tissue for gene expression profiling. It was a class two tumor, and it developed metastases two years after enucleation. Uh, unfortunately, this is a common scenario. Uh, metastases occur, especially to the liver, in about 40 to 50 percent of patients with uveal melanoma. Uh, about 90 percent of the time, they metastasize only to the liver. Although there have been advances in treating the primary tumor, mortality has essentially remained the uh, unchanged for many years. Now, why do these uh, tumors metastasize to the liver? Well, at least in part, there's a receptor ligand uh, gradient, and the tumors that seem to metastasize express high levels of the surface receptor CXCR4 and CMET, and their ligand uh, CXCL12, known as stromal derived factor, and HGF, that's hepatic, hepatocyte. Uh, growth factor are found in high concentrations in the liver. So that's at least part of the answer. Uh, I'm at Emory University, and on my way to Emory University, I spent time at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, D.C., and the chair of the Department of Ophthalmic Pathology for many years was Lawrence Zimmerman, a well-respected uh, ophthalmic pathologist. And in the late 70s, he, McLean, and Foster noted a trend that patients who had their eye enucleated for uveal melanoma tended to die at about two to three years after the enucleation. This was known as the Zimmerman effect, a peak in mortality at two to three years after the diagnosis and treatment of the uveal melanoma. And their hypothesis, the Zimmerman hypothesis, was this was due to spreading of the tumor cells by the physical act of enucleation. Around that time, in the late 70s, a treatment had been uh, popularized for uveal melanoma, and that is plaque brachytherapy. And that offered the opportunity for a prospective randomized clinical trial, uh, and it was a set of clinical trials known as the Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study. And in one of the trials, uh, patients with medium-sized uveal melanoma ra were randomized to enucleation or plaque brachytherapy. Uh, at the end of the trials, it became quite obvious that the mortality was the same regardless of the treatment of the primary tumor. Uh, and as you can see on the left, the graph of uh, mortality over time versus a in the enucleation patient, patients, and on the right, mortality versus time in the plaque brachytherapy patients. And these graphs are virtually identical. Uh, the peak incidence was indeed is what Zimmerman had, sh had found at about two to three years after the initial diagnosis and treatment in both groups. However, there was no difference in either group. So the Zimmerman effect was confirmed. However, there was no difference in either group. So many people believe that the Zimmerman hypothesis was disproven, and this was uh, written about by Arun Singh. Uh, and I helped him with this uh, some years ago, 25 years after the zimmerman mclean foster hypothesis. So how can we explain this Zimmerman effect, which appears to be a real effect? And what are the clinical implications? Well, a number of years ago, in 2012, I talked about this, uh, and this was published in the Zimmerman lecture, where I proposed that the Zimmerman effect can be explained by tumor factors, and the host factors. And these are summarized as the stochastic effect of tumor itself, mutations in the tumor, and the host response in the microenvironment in the liver. So I'm going to talk about the genetics of uveal melanoma, uh, stochastic mutations, and type of mutations in the Zimmerman effect, 
uh, mechanism of BAP1 mutation resulting in increased metastases. And I'm going to talk about the patterns of metastatic uveal melanoma to the liver, uh, the uh, microenvironment or the metastatic niche, and the host response uh, is part of the explanation of the Zimmerman effect in this metastatic niche, and then some treatments that can be based on these findings. Now, as we've heard, uh, the most common mutation in uveal melanoma are the G-protein coupled receptor mutations, GNA11 and GNAQ. Uh, and then it can under, uh, the tumor can progress along one of several pathways. It can either acquire an EFAX mutation in which the tumor will probably not metastasize, an SF3B1 mutation in which the tumor will probably metastasize only after many years, or a BAP1 mutation in which there's a high likelihood the tumor will, will metastasize, and this will occur shortly, uh, actually within a we think within about two to three years after uh, diagnosis, and I'll show evidence for that in a minute. So uh, we feel now that the um, initial mutations are the GNAQ, GNA11 type mutations, gene protein coupled receptor mutations. Then there can be a 6P gain, uh, and the tumor can have an EFAX or an SF3B1 mutation. They're probably mutually exclusive, or a 3P loss and an AQ gain and a BAP1 mutation. And that uh, you can see in the uh, bar on the bottom going from low to intermediate to high risk for metastases. Now we can obtain tumor uh, from the uh, unenucleated eye via fine needle aspiration biopsy and sample this uh, sample DNA from the tumors for gene expression profiling, uh, excuse me, RNA for gene expression profiling, DNA for MLPA and comparative uh, CGH and uh, FISH for looking for monosomy 3. And we can also obtain tumor from enucleated eyes, including formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So there are a number of ways to uh, determine the genotype of the tumor clinically. Uh, now, authors have uh, emphasized in recent years the importance of the gene expression or monosomy 3 in risk for metastases, but only recently it has been shown that the uh, predictive value of the genetics of the tumor is enhanced by uh, knowing the size of the tumor. So larger tumors are more at risk for metastases than smaller tumors, even knowing the, uh, the genotype of the tumor. Uh, the size of the tumor relative to metastasis has been known for years. Here's a publication by Fulberg in 1993 showing uh, large tumors, low survival on this Kaplan-Meier curve, small tumors, high survival. And here's an article showing gene expression profiling, uh, low survival in class 2 tumors, medium survival in class 1b, and pretty much 100% survival in class 1a. Uh, and here are some recent publications showing that adding the size of the tumor plus the gene expression profile or the chromosome status is more predictive of metastasis than either of those uh, data alone. So I worked on a project uh, with Esther Zale. She's in uh, Hungary and a co-author, uh, Dr. Jagger, who's here, where we looked at the association of the metastatic rate with the stochastic mutation rate and type of mutation in the uh, melanoma. And this is actually just going to come out. It's going to be EPUB ahead of print for JAMA ophthalmology on August 2nd. So in a few weeks, you can see it online. So there's a formula for determining the mutation rate in a tumor. It's known as the spherical cap formula, where we can calculate the volume of the tumor, the number of cells in the tumor, just knowing the size of the tumor, the largest basal diameter, and the thickness. And if you divide uh, the metastatic rate by total number of cells, you can determine the, uh, the mutation rate in the tumor. And we did that. We actually did it with two data sets. And one was from Carol Shields' work showing uh, millimeter by millimeter metastatic rate, and we found that the mutation rate in uveal melanomas is about the same, uh, except it's a little higher for small, small tumors. You can see an order of magnitude higher when the tumor is very small. We used our formula on the COMS data set for small, medium, and large tumors, and essentially got the same 
uh, values, uh, high, a little higher mutation rate in smaller tumors, about the same in medium-sized and larger tumors. So what that is telling us is e even though the percentage of mutant cells, and by that I mean cells capable of metastasizing in the tumor, is a little higher in smaller tumors, the total number of cells uh, that are capable of metastasizing are larger in medium and large tumors. So that's at least a stochastic explanation for more metastases in a larger tumor. Now why are there, is there, a, uh, are there higher uh, percentage of mutant tumor cells capable of metastases in a smaller versus medium and large tumor? That's known as, uh, uh, in cancer biology, as the expansion phase of the tumor. So when it first starts to grow, when it first becomes malignant, the percentage of clonal cells, in this case cells capable of metastasizing, are higher than after the, there's exponential growth of the tumor in later stages. And this was actually shown very recently by Bill Harbour's group, uh, looking uh, at uh, uh, network analysis and mutations published in Nature Communications that for uh, BAP1 mutations and other canonical genomic operations, they arise in an early punctated burst. So that's the early expansion phase of the tumor. So uh, this provides an explanation of the likelihood of metastasis relative to size of the tumor. What about the Zimmerman effect, the fact that we see a peak at two to three years after diagnosis and treatment, and those later bumps about four to eight years later? Well, we did a meta-analysis of the data set from the Rotterdam group, and uh, you can see uh, metastases versus time in the BAP1 mutations in red, in SF3B1 mutations in green, and in Dean found essentially two peaks, uh, a large peak at about two to three years after uh, diagnosis and treatment in the BAP1 tumors, and then more, uh, another peak at about uh, 48 years after metastases in the SF3B1 mutations. And this is going to be published in that JAMA article. So this interpretation is Show, essentially it shows that these early muta uh, metastases, the Zimmerman effect, can be explained at least in part by the BAP1 mutant tumors, and the later metastases at least in part by the SF3B1 mutant tumors. But that's not all of the story. Uh, is there an easy way to determine if a UM has a BAP1 mutation? Dr. Copeland has shown this. We have shown it after Dr. Copeland. Others have. And you can actually do an immunostain for BAP1 in the primary tumor. And if there's no staining, if there's lack of staining, it's a mutant protein. So there's a BAP1 mutation. It's actually at least as predictive and probably more so than thickness and larger basal, largest basal diameter. So it's a relatively easy way to test for this. In, in our data set, we showed uh, in the Kaplan-Meier curve, the BAP1 mutants uh, have low, high mortality, low survival, versus the, uh, non, versus the BAP1 wild type. And this is very similar to what was shown in the, uh, uh, from the Rotterdam group. So uh, what is the function of the BAP1 in the metastatic process? Well, we did a, an experiment in which we had BAP1 mutant uveal melanoma cells versus wild type and injected him into a nude mouse, enucleated the eye at seven days, then counted the number of metastases in the liver at two and 10 weeks after enucleation, and indeed found that both at two and 10 weeks, the wild type uh, melanoma had fewer metastases than the BAP1 mutants in this ocular melanoma model, this xenograph, both at two and 10 weeks. And we also did an invasion assay, which showed that the mutant cells exhibited more invasion than the wild type, in an in vitro invasion assay. Now, we compared that to uh, just injecting these melanoma cells in a tail vein, and we didn't get the same result. We used three different aliquots shown on the bottom, and the metastatic rate was the same for wild type versus BAP1 mutant for each of the, uh, each of the uh, aliquots. And the more cells you inject systemically, the more metastases, regardless of whether there's a mutation or not. So this is showing, it supports the role of BAP1 in intravasation of the uveal melanoma from the eye into the circulation. So 
we know that uh, the number of mutated cells and type of mutation, uh, uh, including stochastic phenomena, are relative to the likelihood in time of metastasis. So these are tumor properties. And the BAP1, lack of BAP1 immunostaining is a risk factor for metastases. BAP1 mutation leads to increased number of metastases due to an early expansion phase. And what are the host factors in the microenvironment that suppress or promote uveal melanoma growth after diagnosis and treatment? So we kind of finished half of the story, the tumor half. What about the host part? Uh, why isn't metastatic uveal melanoma found at the time of diagnosis of the primary tumor? Well, a number of years ago, Eskalin and Cavella and also Arun Singh have uh, calculated tumor doubling times and extrapolated uh, data to show that when you diagnose the primary tumor at point B in the eye, it's already been there uh, for some time uh, and uh, for probably many years actually. And then when you see the metastases in the liver, it's, uh, they've been in the liver, they actually arose uh, uh, two to three, or they're found about two to three years after the primary is diagnosed but they've been there almost three years prior to their, even the diagnosis of the primary tumor in the liver. So this was a mathematical prediction of dormant micrometastases in the liver that were clinically undetectable. Here are these dormant micrometastases. They're not detected uh, until point C. So with Sarah Copeland's help uh, and my, my colleague, Dr. Hiragard, we looked at a number of autopsy specimens from patients who died from metastatic uveal melanoma in the liver and were able to determine that there were micrometastases present uh, and there were basically two types of growth of these micrometastases. Uh, the growth in the sinusoidal space in the liver in which the tumor can replace the hepatic lobule, I call that the infiltrating pattern, or the tumor can arise in the periportal area and then efface or push the surrounding liver aside and often exhibit angiogenesis, is there's probably ischemia as these uh, tumor cells grow away from the uh, uh, portal venule. And there's overlap, you can see both patterns in a, in a single liver. Uh, so our lab actually found these micrometastases, and here they are. Here's the uh, nodular pattern on the left, uh, where the tumor is growing around a portal venule, which is an asterisk, and then it's pushing the liver aside, it's effacing it, whereas the infiltrating pattern infiltrates the sinusoidal space. We see the tumor here. It develops what I call pseudosinusoidal spaces, so it's bathed by uh, blood, via uh, spaces lined by stellate cells, and then eventually the uh, liver essentially becomes cirrhotic. There's fibrosis around this lobule that's been completely replaced by melanoma. Uh, we can actually image the nodular, which is uh, versus the uh, infiltrating patterns by MRI, uh, as shown in this article. Uh, there is some overlap and essentially nodular pattern grow, uh, looks like nodules on the MRI and then the stage two and stage three infiltrative pattern also look like nodules as you can see here. They're replacing the lobule. So I call those pseudo nodules by MRI. And I'm working with a group, Jenny Yang's laboratory, on a sensitive MRI contrast agent to uh, determine if it's a nodular versus infiltrating growth pattern. Now we have a mouse model which basically recapitulates the human situation. Uh, this is a xenograft and the tumor metastasizes to the liver, forms micrometastases. So here's a human liver with metastatic uveal melanoma on the left. You see these micrometastases in the sinusoidal space and our mouse model on the right, micrometastases in the sinusoidal space. And we can bring out the infiltrative versus the nodular pattern of growth depending on the cell line used and the mouse that's used. For instance, if we use MEL290 cells in a nude mouse, we see the infiltrative pattern of growth in the liver in the metastatic tumor. These look like little raisins in the sinusoidal space. And if we use uh, a PETF, a pigment epithelium derived factor deficient mouse, uh, uh, the tumor tends to grow in the periportal area and then efface the surrounding liver, resulting in the nodular growth pattern. So 
in the metastatic cascade, the tumor uh, e uh, extends from the eye into the systemic circulation. This is a process that's known as intravasation and invades va its intrinsic vasculature. Then it extravasates, in this case, into the liver, and the tumor cells may die. Many of them do, the vast majority, probably in the circulation, uh, or they may be dormant micrometastases, and they may grow uh, eventually in the sinusoidal space or in the periportal area where they exhibit uh, uh, angiogenesis. Uh, so in this microenvironment, there are many factors that are involved with suppression and, uh, of tumor growth and release of suppression or emergence from dormancy, and these include non-immune factors. I showed one, which is pigment epithelium-derived factor in the, and I'll show it again, in the uh, PETF-deficient mice, the tumors grow, and that's a host factor, and there are others. Uh, uh, and one of the factors, non-immune non factors that probably are related to uh, emergence from dormancy uh, are hi is hypoxia. Uh, and then there are the immune factors that we've heard about so nicely from uh, Dr. Jagger, uh, including uh, in her work showing uh, the importance of NK cells. And there, is, uh, there are T cells also in the liver. We found the T cells may mainly around the portal triad and NK cells mainly in the sinusoidal space. So here's some of our experiments with the PETF null mice. The number of metastases, and we can classify them as uh, small, medium, or large, are, I mean, the number are about the same, but the size is different. On the bottom is small, medium, and large. So there are more medium and large tumors in the PETF null mouse than the, um, than, uh, the uh, wild type or the heterozygous, and this is due to, uh, uh, basically, in part, to angiogenesis and stromogenesis. So the stroma proliferates in the pet ethanol mouse, as, uh, including uh, stellate cells and collagen uh, versus the wild type. And there's an angiogenesis as well. But the tumor in the eye remains the same size. Uh, we've also depleted NK cells and uh, gotten the number of tumors to increase in the liver uh, and increase in size, and then we've, boost, we've used uh, NK cell boost to eliminate these tumors uh, with interferon alpha-2b. So here's some uh, NK cells attacking a micrometastasis in the liver in an interferon-treated mouse. So we can actually allow the micrometastases to grow or eliminate them, uh, at least in part, using uh, NK boost. So this is our working model of the microenvironment. In the infiltrating pattern, uh, the tumor cells grow and they're, they remain dormant, but work from the Niederkorn lab has shown that my, myeloid-derived cell IL-10 suppresses NK cells, and this might allow for emergence from dormancy. Also, when the tumor becomes hypoxic, they express CMET and CXCR4, which are downstream from the hypoxia response element. And in the nodular pattern, uh, the, uh, there is even more going on. There are T cells involved. Uh, there's MDC IL-10, myeloid-derived uh, cell IL-10 suppression of the tumor in the periportal area, likely. Uh, the Volpert lab from Northwestern has shown that PDGF, BB, and TGF beta expressed from the melanoma uh, blocks uh, hepatocyte uh, stellate, or uh, the stellate cell uh, uh, expression of PEDFs, PEDF. So that increases the VEGF to PEDF ratio, allows for angiogenesis. And we talked a little bit, or Dr. Jagger, a little bit about the T cells and how they're blocked by checkpoints. Um, do you want me to stop here? Because I have some more. What's that? Oh, so uh, we—I was going to show some some treatments that we have experimentally based on um, the host factors and immune factors, but uh, and then talk a little bit about the checkpoint inhibitors and a new exciting one, uh, uh, an MTAC molecule. In which, which recognizes cancer cells and links them to T cells. I think Dr. Carvalho is going to talk about these. And in kind of an interesting case where the checkpoint inhibitor, there was uh, liver-derived treatment, and then patient was given checkpoint inhibitors, 
then MTACs, and then responded. The uh, METs went away with uh, the checkpoint inhibitors. So our, in summary, this is our working hypothesis. The Zimmerman effect uh, is due at least in part by a stochastic tumor burden, uh, and uh, the mutation rate uh, and uh, BAP1-dependent de uh, uh, intravasation of tumors into the circulation, uh, they go to the liver at least in part by this receptor ligand uh, uh, gradient, and they may emerge from dormancy. So this is, can in part explain the Zimmerman effect uh, due to uh, MDC IL-10 uh, um, suppression of NK cells and uh, uveal melanoma uh, suppression of, of PEDF resulting in an increased VEGF to PEDF ratio. And of course, we know about the checkpoints that may be involved with this as well. So you, here, here are my collaborators, and I wish to acknowledge all of them. This is a summary of many years of work and uh, some of my funding agencies. So thank you very much.